Uh, right. <clears throat> yes. Th thank you. Uh, thank you, Igor, uh, for the introduction. Right. So I'm going to be talking about uh, strange uh, expectations. Uh, this is uh, this is joint work with um, Marco Thiel, uh, who has um, uh, left uh, thinking about root systems uh, to to go into uh, wealth management, uh, and it's also joint work with uh, Eric Stuckey uh, at the University of Minnesota, and he will be um, he is applying for jobs right now. So for his sake, I hope that this talk goes well. Um, and uh, I'm going to be talking about mostly this this check mark. Actually, usually it's like, oh, I'm going to tell you about the title. Actually, I'm mostly going to talk about the check mark. So in the background, I don't know if anyone's on Twitter. I'm not, uh, but um, apparently, if you're like a famous person. Um, on Twitter, uh, you know, maybe like um, or journalist or something like that. Then what you can do is you can get a blue check mark, which means that um, you are uh, uh, you're, you're kind of like certified uh, that you're the real person. Um, and, and and this this is kind of about putting a blue check mark. I guess it's kind of hard to get. Like you need to have a lot of followers and so on. Uh, and uh, and this is kind of about putting a blue check mark on uh, on this paper that uh, that I wrote with Marco Thiel a while ago. Uh, and it's kind of hard to get that blue check mark. Okay, so let me sort of explain what's what's going on here. So so here I've got uh, so, some notions. Uh, don't don't really worry about them too much. What I would like to point out though is that um, so I have like a, you know a root system. I've got positive roots, rank, file group, whatever. But uh, here I've got this dual Coxeter number. So um, a nice definition for the dual Coxeter number is so if I have a if I have a, a root, then I can take uh, the dual of this root. Don't worry, this is this is by way. If you're not if you're not following, it doesn't matter. Uh, then I can take the I can take the co root, and this would be the following guy. Um, and uh, so one way to express uh, the Coxeter number is it's going to be sort of uh, I guess um, if I wrote the highest root as a sum of simple roots. Uh, with some coefficients, then h could be defined as one plus the sum of uh, these coefficients. The dual Coxeter number, this g here, uh, what's going on with that? Well, that's if I take the highest root and I take its, uh, I take the corresponding co root, and then I express this as a sum of um, of, of simple co roots. Then uh, then g is going to be one plus uh, that sum. The sum of those coefficients. So this is this is already getting kind of dubious. This is the the dual Coxeter number. I, hopefully, I haven't lost you already. Uh, and you know that you're doing something wrong when uh, you have a, a G check, which is the dual Coxeter number of the dual root system. Uh, so this is very bad. Uh, and um, and I'll try to talk about a little bit about why this is uh, this is so disgusting. I mean, that's not the Coxeter number, by the way. Those duals don't don't like commute. Okay. Uh, so 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 here we are. Um, let's uh, let's. Let's let's go to type A. Everyone loves type A. Uh, so let's talk about cores. Uh, let's talk about cores. Okay. So um, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk about uh, partitions. Everyone loves partitions, and uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take um, uh, we're going to talk about rim hooks. And in this case, let me let me set uh, A to be five. So I'm going to take uh, rim hooks of, of size five. So I'm trying to remove these uh, connected boundary strips of, of five boxes. So for example, I could remove these five. And, uh, and having done that, I guess maybe I could remove uh, these five. And having done that, maybe there's some more that I can remove. Uh, maybe I could remove one, two, three, four, five like that. Uh, having done that, maybe I could remove here, one, two, three, four, five. And hopefully there's maybe one more that I can do. Yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so these are rim hooks and I've removed them. And what you're seeing here is what's left over is, uh, is this shape. I don't think there are any more rim hooks. And that's the shape that's, uh, that's on, on the right there. Okay, so, um, so you can try to remove all the rim hooks. And the, the claim is that the order actually in which you, you remove these doesn't matter. Let me, let me give you another example. So if I, if I were to do, you know, remove that rim hook, and now instead I could remove, uh, say, uh, there's another rim hook here, which is this one. One, two, three, four, five, and then I could remove this one. One, two, three, four, five, and uh, and carry on. Maybe I'll do here. One, two, three, four, five, and uh, and follow. And finally, one, two, three, four, five. I get back the same shape, but I did it in a different order. Those are not the same rim hooks. You could probably see that. And I get I get back the same shape uh, as on here. So the order doesn't matter. It's a little bit weird. And um, the partitions with with no none of these uh, rim hooks uh, of of some particular fixed size, uh, they're going to be called uh, cores, a cores. Okay. 
Um, so why is this? Well, the point is that you're, you're supposed to record things in a very nice way. So what we're going to do is we're going to walk up the boundary of this partition uh, and record uh, what we see as we go along. So let me sort of try to do this. So I start out at the bottom and I start recording and I, and I just see a whole bunch of uh, little beads. We'll call them beads. We're going to put them on this abacus. So again, in this case, I have uh, A is equal to five. So I'm building a five abacus for this, for this guy. So I, I go up and I see a whole bunch of beads and then I see a gap. Right here, there's a gap. There's no bead, so I'm, I'm recording up steps versus over steps. That's what I'm recording. And now I see two two up steps. So I see two up steps. Then I see four up steps. Uh, one, two, three, four. Then there's an over step and up step. Uh, I see an over step and up step. I see an over step and two up steps. Let me keep track of this one with red, uh, just for fun, because we're going to play with him in a second. And then uh, over up and over up, over up, over up. So this is just by way of uh, establishing some conventions. Uh, I hope uh, I didn't take too long with that. So I just recorded the boundary. And then of course, as I head off this way, it's all it's all just gaps. It's all oversteps. So that's all these all these oversteps here. And uh, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to consider what happens if I push this uh, this red guy up. Okay. And the claim is that this is going to be removing uh, a, a rim hook. So let's just see. Let's just see that in action. So as I move this up, like so, uh, what happens? Well, um, the idea is that this guy moves over five. So I count one, two, three, four, five. It would, it would uh, replace that overstep there. It's interchanging. So I come down here. Oops. Uh, here we go. I take this guy and I move it to here. And then the five the five steps here would go like so. Okay, and so what's happened is that uh, one, two, uh, three, four, and five, so, so these two interchanged, right? And so you can see that uh, I've removed, say, this, this rim hook. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, good. Uh, so, so that's what's happening. Oh, okay, so now we understand uh, why it doesn't matter what order is, things are happening in. We understand everything. A cores, uh, and what are the cores? They're exactly the shapes that are, that are flush. That is to say, if I take everything and I move it up, uh, if I move them up as high as they can go. Don't select. Okay, there we go. Right. So these these would be the A cores, and that would have been removing all of the all of the hooks. Wonderful. So they're flush. A cores are flush. All right. Type A. Beautiful. Okay. So um, there's a fun way to generate these. So if you think for a moment, the two cores are exactly the staircases, and uh, we can generate these. Um, in the following way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to act by this infinite dihedral group. Um, it doesn't exactly uh, matter for the moment, but what I want to think about is uh, S0 is going to try, so I'm, I'm labeling uh, N cross N with content, uh, you know, sort of uh, mod two, content mod two. Uh, so it just looks like the, the sequence, uh, obviously, you know, there's dot, 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 and dot, dot, dot here. And um, what I want to imagine happening is I'm going to act, so S0, uh, this, this symbol is going to act by adding or removing all boxes with content zero, and S1 is going to add or remove all boxes with content one. So if we do this, uh, so for example, I can act by S0, and I want to maintain the shape, the, the partition shape. So I would get like that guy, and so that would just be a single box uh, with maybe, if you want, I could put a zero in there just to keep track of things. And then, for example, if I act by S1, uh, then what happens? Well, now I can add here. If I act by S0, I just remove the zero box. So I'm adding or removing all of the boxes that I can. And as long as I started from the empty thing, uh, I'm never going to have any, any choices. I'm never going to go wrong. So now I'd get, I'd get this shape. Uh, and then maybe I could go S0 again. Uh, so now I'd add all the zeros that I can. And you can see that I'm generating all of the, uh, all of the staircases. Um, good. Okay, and I could, I could just keep going with that. And those are exactly the two cores. So I generated all of them. So I'm, I'm generating them. Okay, we could do the same thing for three cores. Uh, and by the same thing, um, I'm, I'm gonna actually do something different. So in this time, S0, so first of all, I'm gonna take A is equal to three. Uh, I wanna take the, the content mod three, so zero, one, two, et cetera. Uh, but now S0 is going to add uh, or remove uh, boxes with zero. S1 is going to add or remove boxes with one. And S2 is going to, um, well, conjugate. Okay, so let's see what happens. This is a little bit strange. So first I can act with uh, S0. Uh, so what happens, I get this guy. And so that's just a single box. I mean, I'll just keep track of the, the partition shape. Then I can act, say, by uh, S1. See, conjugation of a single box doesn't do anything. So if I act by one now, then I would add in uh, uh, this one. And so I'd get to uh, this shape. And now having done that, uh, I can conjugate. And that gives me something new. Uh, what it gives me is, uh, is this guy, zero, two. Uh, so that's acting by two, which is conjugation, which is like, what? What's going on with that? Uh, okay. And then I could act, now actually, uh, now I could act by uh, one again, I guess. So I'll act by one, and that will add me these two guys. Uh, so let's draw that in. 
Okay, and then I can act, I have a choice either zero or two. So I guess zero would send me that way, two would send me that way. Let's, let's just do it. So two, two transposes, so that would send me to here. And if I act by zero, then I would add in these two guys. So that would get to here. Uh, yeah. Okay. And that actually commutes. So if I, if I, if I, if I did, if I could, then I could do a two or zero and I'd build up some sort of, some sort of picture like this. Okay. So, so first of all, like, it's like, what's going on with the conjugation. Um, but if you did this, you'd get some sort of shape that looks like that. This should look familiar, uh, or maybe it doesn't. And that's also cool. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. So as zero, as one as two don't form an affine Dinkin diagram, they don't, as, as zero is to commute. Yes. Yes, yes, you're on the right, you're on the right track. Yes. Uh, so yes, this should, uh, you know, yeah, that's sort of strange. It's not what you expected, right? S2 conjugating is a weird thing. Uh, but that's just to give you an example of, of the sort of things that we can do. Uh, here's, here's, uh, here's what you expected to see was just uh, SI adding or removing all the boxes, right? That's what you expect to see. And here it's just the general, you know, you act by zero and, and that adds here. And then you'd act by, you know, one, or, uh, maybe two or one. And, and so you'd end up here or here and, and so on. And, and you, this, is, this, is, this is of course an action of the, of the affine uh, symmetric group. Uh, and you can even see the symmetric group coming in. Let me just do a couple more here. Uh, you, could, you, could, you can check me. That this is this is what the, the thing is saying, and I come back around so you can see a little symmetric group here because this is a two one two. This is like a little braid relation. This was a one two and one. Okay, uh, and if you kept doing that, you'd see this particular shape. Hopefully, uh, yeah, I did. Okay, it looks right. Um, okay, so uh, so this is this actually works for any a. Uh, so this is a way to generate the a cores. It's kind of interesting, and so you can ask like, what's what actually is going on? What's what's what, I mean, this is a, a funny thing you can do, but what's actually happening? Um, so let's figure that out. So what's happening here is that um, uh, I actually have lattice points and the lattice points that I have are really this co-root lattice. So let, let, me, let, me, let me explain a little bit. So, um, so here I've drawn the abacus and I've also drawn this interesting line. And I'd like to explain what that line is. This line is separating. Uh, so, so first of all, I have the boundary, this, this, this boundary word that I've just, I've just encoded. So this word, so we can do that again. So it's like all blues, then a gap, then blues, then a gap, then blue, two gaps, blue gap and so on, then all gaps. And now the point is that I wanna have the same number of, uh, of, of, of white things below this line as, 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 uh, as, as beads, okay? The number of gaps is the number of beads. And there's a unique spot to do that. Uh, I, guess, I guess it's probably, I wanna have the right number of, uh, of gaps. So there are two gaps here, there are two beads here. So I should cut right there. Uh, I think that that's right. So I should cut right here. And that's what, this, that's what this cut is keeping track of. And the reason I'm doing that is it's sort of a, before, where do I start? It wasn't clear where I started. I didn't really tell you how to start encoding this abacus. Now it's clear, there's a unique spot to cut. And having done that cut, what happens is that this is, uh, if I read the heights, so if I have a core, the core is flush. That is to say, it's, it's completely, all the beads are as high up as they can go. There are no gaps. And so I can just return the height from this sort of, this sort of balancing line. And so for example, uh, here, uh, the, this guy is right at the balancing line. So the height is zero. The next guy is also zero. But then uh, this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this runner has, a, has one that's one above. So I'd record a one, and then the same way I'd see a negative two and then another one. And so really what I'm seeing is a lattice point. Cores are lattice points. They're, they're a nice way of encoding lattice points. Um, and, and in terms of the, the runners and so on, you can interpret what the actions of these SIs, these, these weird things that I was claiming had something to do with the symmetric group or maybe the affine symmetric group, um, these swap coordinates in some way. Okay. So we get these lattice points. Those are the same thing as cores. That's, that's sort of the point here. Uh, and so of course you should uh, ask about generalizing or maybe you shouldn't, but that's what we did. Um, and hey, so- hey, bef Before you do, let's, uh, hold, hold on, hold on. Nathan, yeah. I, I think it's time uh, to slow down a little bit and uh, uh, ask if there are any questions. Oh, thank you, Igor. Are there any questions? See, there are none. Um, uh, Actually, can you explain uh, the you action X? Where are you going? What's that? Uh, can you explain the action S zero? The X, the, the S zero? Yeah. Yeah, um, well, I don't, I don't want to, but yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, so I have, I mean, what's secretly happening here is there's an affine Dinkin diagram and, uh, and this, this generates uh, this, this affine symmetric group. And uh, the, the S zero is, uh, is one of the generators of this, of this particular reflection group. Um, so I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that, but I want to sweep uh, as much as I can under the rug. Are you asking just how it acts on the coordinates? 
Yes, actually, I'm only asking how it works. How it actually yeah, works. so the idea is S0 would take this, this runner and this runner, and it would interchange them, but it would shift, uh, it would shift this one up and this one down as it interchanged them. Uh -huh. So it, maybe if you like, you could think about it as like being on a torus or something. And as you rotate it, uh, there's, some sort of, there's some sort of interesting action like that. Okay. okay. Yeah, uh, good. So, uh, other can questions? you also say here, uh, so you had two different things for SI. One was conjugation, another one was the usual add. Which one is? Which one are you talking about here? Yeah, so here, this S2 conjugating is very, very special. It's a, it's a special thing uh, that I, I wanted to throw in, uh, but maybe that was misguided. Uh, now, uh, in general, when I'm doing generating A cores, forget about conjugation. It's what you expected. Okay. It's the story that you expected with no conjugation. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? OK. Uh, anyway, so I hopefully I established the conventions reasonably well uh, and so N on. Nathan, s uh, say where you're going. Uh, where am I headed? Uh, well, I will. I will say where I'm going. I'm going to have a moral at the end. Don't worry. I'm, I'm generalizing now. I'm generalizing. Uh, for, first, I need to uh, first I need to talk about generalizing. I'm going to I'm going to produce. Uh, I'm going to generalize to co-roots and talk about how co-roots are actual cores. Then uh, and then we'll see. Then we'll keep moving. Um, okay, so 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 the point is that these these lattice points are actually cores uh, uh, in type A. So we can generalize to to other types, and so we we replace uh, these various objects that are type A objects with these various objects that are that are beyond type A. And if you want, by appropriately embedding uh, these other types into um, into the type A story, usually by some sort of folding or doubling or whatever, um, you can uh, find combinatorial models. So. Uh, uh, Pavel, to, to answer your question here, uh, so in type A, this is these are the A cores are modeling this co root lattice, including this this action of the affine symmetric group. In type G two, it's very special. This is this is uh, so so the point is that G two, if you choose your conventions correctly, has the same co root lattice as type A two. Okay, and so 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 you can see that the hexagons look exactly the same. It's just that the action of the group is slightly different, and so we modified one of the generators. And indeed, uh, since you asked about the affine Dicke diagram, right, it's looking something like like this. And so indeed, you know, here's uh, S zero and here's S two, and so they do commute. Okay, so so you get Ooh. this 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 funny yeah you get this funny little three core model um, exactly. Uh, that's why I wanted to throw that in, but you know maybe that was not the right time. Um, Okay, and then like for example, in type C, uh, you get um, you get these self conjugate cores uh, for A even. Whatever. Uh, the point here, Igor, is that uh, co root lattices are generalizing A cores. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, let's now let's now do some history and let's talk about uh, McDonald's denominator identities and tell us why this is interesting and, uh, and how this connects to our story. Uh, okay. So um, so here's a here's a nice theorem. Uh, so let me let me sort of tell you what this theorem is saying, uh, and then then I'll then I'll then I'll prove it to you. Okay. So um, what I have on the on the left hand side here, uh, this is of course the generating function uh, for uh, integer partitions, uh, and and of course it's for uh, you, it's a generating function by number like the number of boxes of what it's partitioning right by number of boxes. Okay. So far so good, right? Everyone's everyone's good on that. Uh, so um, on this side, then, what this looks like, uh, since there's this, uh, there's this A here to the eighth power, this looks like an A tuple um, of, uh, of partitions. And again, weighted by number of boxes, but this time A times the number of boxes. So, uh, so it's A times the number of boxes. Okay. And, uh, and finally, then, this last piece right here, this is just the generating function so this is the generating function for A tuples of partitions, and this is just the generating function uh, for uh, A cores uh, by the number of boxes. Okay, so by the number of boxes. Okay, so everyone's clear on what this is saying. So what it's saying is then I should take a partition, say this partition, and I should decompose it into an A tuple of partitions along with the core. How do I do that? Well, I've already done it. So what I do is uh, I, I encode the boundary as I've done here, okay? And now what I'll do is I'll read down the strands, okay? I've got A strands and I can read down them. And if I read down them, they tell me a boundary word of another partition. So for example, uh, here I'd see all ups and then a bunch of overs, all overs. So this is really the empty partition, 
the empty integer partition. This one I see ups, then I see two overs, then I see two ups, and then I see all overs. So this is really the partition two, two. Okay, then here again, I see all ups, then all overs. So this is empty. Here I'd see overs, uh, I see, sorry, ups for a while. Then I see an over. Then I see uh, an up, that's the, this guy right here, uh, this guy right here, and then all overs. So this is just uh, a single box. And the last one again is an empty partition. Okay, so I get this A tuple of partitions. Uh, that's not enough though to recover my original partition. What's interesting is how they're glued together. How do I keep track of how they're glued together? Well, by lit, by pushing everything up, by pushing all of the boxes, the, uh, all of the all of the, uh, the the beads that can be pushed up, I recover a core, right? And that core is exactly encoding how uh, the the different strands are glued together. So I get an A tuple of partitions along with the core. So this is what this uh, theorem is saying, and this is the proof. And I can go backwards. Importantly, I needed this uniqueness. Uh, I needed to have it be balanced in this way so that there were the same number, these four dots above, the, the, the four beads above as the, the four guys below, because I need that uniqueness um, to, to uniquely be able to recover uh, my, uh, uh, my integer partition on the left-hand side. Any questions on, on, that, uh, on that beautiful bijection? Okay, so we're gonna generalize that. Uh, Oh, go ahead. So that's a good question. So, can you just do this like uh, using the using this uh, what, uh you the way that you remove the rims, like take a course and then see how many rims that can go to this thing, and then they are they actually just uh, count all the partitions. Right. So as you move these up in order to produce uh, the core that's uh, that's that's counted by here, that's removing a boxes uh, at a go, and that's why you're getting this a times the number of boxes. So yes, the the core is really obtained by removing these rim hooks. That's exactly right. Yep. Good. Um, so so to figure out what the right generalization of this of this formula is, we have to go to um, uh, a, a really beautiful article of McDonald's uh, where he where he comes up with this. Um, this affine denominator formula. So what I've stated here is not the way that he stated it. Um, he didn't know what these were, these multiplicities of these, of these roots. Uh, he had some sort of mysterious factors going on. And later this was cleared up by, uh, by Katz and Moody, um, where these are multiplicities of imaginary roots. Well, you should think about this. If you look at this, you should think that this is like a, a vile denominator formula for, for simple Lie algebras, where you'd just be doing over, over a positive roots, you'd be looking at a product over positive roots, and you'd be summing over, um, over just a vile group. So it looks like some sort of, um, I'm, sure, I'm sure you could state this in terms of some sort of symmetric function identity. Uh, I didn't, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so, uh, so you have this, um, uh, so, so, so McDonald has this denominator, uh, affine denominator formula, which, which led to uh, just an explosion of work. Um, and, and, and these multiplicities are still not really understood outside of, outside of affine type, I'd say. Um, good. Um, and this, this, uh, this denominator formula leads to all sorts of amazing specializations, okay? So um, if you like partition identities, and I know Igor does, uh, then you get all sorts of beautiful ones. So you get the pentagonal number theorem. Uh, so this is some sort of Q notation, but you know the pentagonal number theorem, so that's fine. You get uh, this, this formula, of course, you know this one. You get the triple product identity. I think that comes from just the a, affine A1. Uh, and then... And then you get a bunch of other ones too that were that were known sort of uh, these these strange specimens. Uh, now Dyson wrote down an interesting identity for uh, for Ramanujan's tau function. Uh, this this particular nice. I'm not telling you what it's, the sum is over, but he wrote down this very beautiful formula. And if you look closely, you might see a type A root system lurking there. Um, and and what uh, what this formula lets you do if you specialize it correctly, it lets you get a formula for um, well basically. Uh, this thing raised to, well, not that thing, but uh, maybe, what, what do I call it? Uh, eta, eta raised to, um, uh, to the dimension of any simple Lie algebra. That's what it gives you. In fact, it gives you something more and we're getting very, very close to blue checkmark territory. So let me, uh, let me uh, tell you about this. So here, um, Dyson has a, a, a nice paper called Missed Opportunities. Uh, so let me, let me read a little bit. He says, uh, uh, pursuing these identities further by pedestrian methods, I found that there exists a formula of the same degree of elegance as the formula for the tau function, this thing, Dyson's formula for the tau function, um, for the dth power eta, whenever d belongs to the following sequence of integers. And so he has three, uh, that's like a one, uh, 
uh, eight, that's like A2, B, that's like uh, B or C2, uh, 14, that's like G2. Actually, I think he's missing seven. Um, there's 15, 21, et cetera. Okay, if these numbers had appeared in the context of a problem in physics, you would have recognized them as the dimension of the finite dimensional simple Lie algebras, except for 26. Why 26 is there, I still do not know. There's the 26. And uh, you can see there's a, a blue check mark there. Uh, so, so this is, um, and this is why I'm, this is sort of why we're talking about this today. And this is, this is Freeman Dyson's missed opportunities. Uh, he goes on, he says, uh, he, he talks about how uh, uh, McDonald's uh, daughter and his daughter were at the same school and so on. But this was another missed opportunity, but not a tragic one since McDonald cleared up, uh, cleaned up the whole subject very happily without any help from me. Uh, the only thing he did not clean up was the case D equals 26, which remains a tantalizing mystery. Um, and, uh, and so here I've put the, uh, the, uh, the Twitter, this is disputed uh, because um, oh, somewhat after uh, Manas, Trisky, Manas Tiersky, excuse me, uh, published a paper called uh, Appendix to, to Dyson's uh, paper, Missed Opportunities. And he says, a more careful study of, the, of McDonald's uh, article shows that the identity for the 26 power is not really such a mystery. Okay, so it's a mystery, it's not a mystery. Okay, so why? Well, it's related to uh, F4. Uh, F4, uh, the Lie algebra, uh, the adjoint representation is a 52. In the space of dual roots, uh, F4 check, and the space of roots are not the same. And somehow this is this is leading to the 26. 26 is uh, what, what might be like the 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 short the 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 short adjoint representation, the dimension of the short adjoint. And seven would be like the dimension of the the short adjoint for G2. So somehow if you take the highest short root, then something else, then something comes out. So. You can see that once you have two root lengths, things get messy and annoying, and you have to start putting check marks everywhere. Uh, very, very annoying. Okay, so um, missed opportunities. Very nice. Oh, he, oh, he says the identities for uh, eight of the 26 and eight of the seventh are considerably more complicated. And then he just leaves it at that. He doesn't even state them. It's not like, it's not like you know, I don't know why there is. He just doesn't say, he doesn't say them. So that's very helpful. Um, okay, uh, let me, let me tell you about another specialization of McDonald's denominator formula now um, in simply laced type. Um, so, um, and let, so, so you get this specialization and what you're doing basically is, uh, I think you're taking something like E to the alpha and you're replacing it by uh, omega to the height of alpha. If you do this specialization, uh, so whatever the height of a root is, it doesn't matter. And omega is an H root of unity where H is the Coxeter number. Okay, so let me explain. Uh, so a Coxeter element in type A would just be like a long cycle, like uh, one, two, I guess we're doing uh, up to A. So we're looking at uh, the symmetric group on A letters. So a Coxeter element would be like that. And if I'm thinking about the characteristic polynomial, uh, so first of all, H is equal to A. Uh, the dimension of this thing, uh, of, of the ambient space is A minus one, annoyingly as always. Um, and the, the, so then I also have that the, the characteristic polynomial of the long cycle, if I were to write this in, um, well, um, in the reflection representation, uh, then it would be, I guess, uh, one minus uh, X to the A divided by one minus X. So what this identity is saying is that if I look at the product uh, from I is equal to one up to infinity of uh, this, uh, uh, of the C of X, this, uh, this characteristic polynomial, which we've just figured out, it's uh, one minus X to the uh, A I divided by uh, one minus X to the I, because I'm evaluating X to the I, then this is equal to the following product. The product now from I is equal to one up to infinity. Uh, and I'm gonna have one over one minus X to the H, but H is A, A, I. I'm raising that to the N. N is A minus one because it's the dimension of the ambient space. And then I'm multiplying by this sum of, uh, of well, of roots. Uh, uh, so let's do Q and Q. Uh, and then this, this uh, X, this is just the formal variable. And then to this inner product. Um, so we'll put it as uh, A over two times Q minus rho, whatever rho is, who cares? Uh, Ta-da, okay. So, um, so the point is that if I take this guy and move it over there, uh, let's actually do that. Uh, so let me, let me just cross it out, go away. This top part goes away and I'll just move it onto the bottom. Then this one goes away. And I'm left with something that looks remarkably like the formula that we started out proving, yeah? Uh, the only thing that's different is that we have uh, this, this formula instead of summing over cores. But we already talked about how, uh, how co-roots were the same thing as cores. So this sum really is over cores, okay? And so what this is telling us is that this is the statistic for number of boxes of a core. That's what that's telling us. Any questions on that? On that beautiful little uh, specialization? Is it, is it to say that that's the number of boxes for, for type A? 
It's not so bad. You can give a direct argument that this thing, so if you actually wrote down what row was, then you could do it in turn. You could definitely just argue directly, yes. Okay. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we have this. Oh, by the way, that's only simply laced type, right? So, uh, so let's go back to the, to the paper of McDonald. What happens when, they're, when, they're, when it's not simply laced, when there are roots of multiple lengths? Oh, well, he, he helpfully tells us that uh, the formula is more complicated, uh, so he's not going to reproduce it. Okay, so when you do write it down, you do get something that's more complicated. Um, and um, I think that this could be simplified somewhat. I didn't bother. And I'm not even gonna tell you, look, look at all this annoying stuff that you have to deal with. So don't worry about it, uh, it's okay. Um, you can write it down. And so you would get a notion of, of size in, in other types. But just, to, just you know, to show you, this blue check mark is a little annoying to get, okay? Uh, you have to be a famous person or something like that. Uh, Okay, so yeah, for several reasons, when Marco and I wrote our original strange expectations paper, we did not have the correct statistic size. Uh, you know, I'd like to give you another way to think about size really, really quickly. Um, so what I could do is I could mark off uh, sort of the heights of the hyperplane. So this is like the height one, height two, height three. Uh, this is like height one, so this is the origin for me. This is height one, this is height two, and so on, height three. And then here, this would be like height one, height two, height three. So let's pay attention to this guy right here. This core has five boxes, right? I'd like to show you another way to compute that five. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to just keep track of the, the heights of the hyperplanes that I cross as I go to the identity. So as I, as I walk to the identity, uh, uh, to, 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 this, to, this, to this rectangle right here, right near the origin, uh, I'd like to keep track of the heights that I see. So what do I see? I see a height one, I see a height two, I see a height one and I see a height one. And of course, uh, well, one plus one plus one plus two is, is five. And that's the number of boxes. So this is another way. And we were wedded to this way of thinking. And this is another reason why we kind of missed uh, the right definition. It turns out that to do it in non simply laced types, you have to start weighting things um, by, uh, you have to treat long and short roots differently. And we weren't expecting to have to do that because we, we, we liked this definition so much. We were just adding up heights of roots without weighting them. Okay. So what's the summary, uh, Igor? Uh, well, the first thing was that uh, co-root lattices generalize acores. And the second thing is that now we have a quadratic form on these co-root lattices that generalize the statistic for the number of boxes. Okay, so we're slowly building up uh, the technology to talk about sort of stuff in general type. Okay, so now let's talk about simultaneous cores in the summers region. And we'll go a bit quickly, a bit more quickly. Uh, we, may, we may not do uh, Mark Heyman's proof, because, even though it's so beautiful, so beautiful. Okay, uh, let me show you this. Um, okay, so uh, this is a really, really gorgeous bijection. I will say a few words about why it's true. Uh, I don't know if you're gonna get them, but that's fine. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're going to look at the hooks uh, so I'm going to take a core. So right here, I've got a core. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to count the number of simultaneous A, B cores where A and B are co-prime, okay? It's a lot of weird conditions, but what does it mean? You know, for, it turns out that there are finitely many uh, uh, such, such, uh, such cores that are both simultaneously A and, and B cores. So here's how you do a bijection. What we're going to do is this, this number uh, by the cycle lemma, for example, since A and B are co-prime, would count the number of dick paths uh, inside of an A by B rectangle. So staying above the diagonal, say, okay? So the bijection is as follows. Um, first, let me go ahead and uh, just keep track of the hooks in the, in the, in the first column. So the, the hooks, like, so for the, the this, this, this guy right here, had, I see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. So I write down an 11. That's the hook length in that, in that, in that, um, in that box. And then I'd see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, sorry about that. Nine, and I'd, I'd keep going. Uh, here I'd see one, two, three, four, five, six. This is six. And then this is four, three, two, and one. Okay, so I just write down the, um, the hook lengths in those boxes. If you want, it's not so hard to see that really what this is doing is it's keeping track of after this initial uh, overstep, it's keeping track of the positions in the path of, um, of the up step. So like one, two, three, four, not five, not five, then six, not seven, not eight, then nine, not seven. Okay, okay, you, okay you, can, you can convince yourself that you could read this off of the abacus. Uh, okay, so now I'd like to get a dick path out of this. Uh, what do I do? Well, I'm gonna label the plane uh, in, in the following way. Uh, as I go up, I'll add B. As I go over, I'll subtract A. And um, since A and B are co-prime, we do have one appearing in there. 
Uh, so every number appears in here. In fact, this is my favorite proof of the Chinese remainder theorem because what's happening here, so let me, let me write something down. As I go up, I'm adding A. As I go over, I'm subtracting B. And so the, if you like the, um, did I do that right? Well, whatever, up B minus A, there we go. Plus A minus B, didn't matter. Um, but uh, so what's the point is that uh, the residue, the, if, I look at, if I look at rows, those are, those are residue classes modulo say B, uh, modulo A, the rows are mo uh, residue classes modulo A, the columns are residue classes uh, modulo B. And so if I look for an intersection, that's exactly Chinese remainder theorem. Okay, whatever. So one appears in it uh, because A and B are co-prime. So every number appears in it. And now I can start uh, listing off. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just record these hooks. So I had the one, then I'll keep track of where two is. I'll keep track of where three is. I'll keep track of where four is. If you like, I'm taking the abacus and I'm, um, let, me, uh, let me actually shade those in a little bit more. Uh, I'm keeping track of the abacus, but I've, 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 uh, I'm keeping track simultaneous of the A and the B abaci. So now I have six is right here. I have nine, which is right here. And I have 11, which is right here. And if I think about what's going on, this is actually tracing out a path, okay? And the reason is that it's, the, the rows and columns are each encoding abaci. Abaci are flush. So once I contain you know, an element uh, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in this row, I have to contain every element to the right of it in that row and also every element below it from the A and the B flush conditions. Okay, so I've sort of combined the A and the B abaci together. So this gives me um, uh, a dick path. And then if you like by psycho lemma, you get the number uh, of dick paths. Okay, let's move quickly. You can interpret what this means in terms of lattice paths. And uh, sorry, in terms of the lattice points, it's some sort of condition on the points themselves. So if I have this point, uh, this lattice point, this co-root point, uh, this is just in type A, so sums to zero, then I can write down some conditions. It doesn't matter what they are. They specify, it's just, uh, they're gonna be lattice points living in some kind of simplex. And that lets you generalize. So this, this region is named after Eric Summers, much to his surprise. Okay, so, um, the point here is that uh, you get this, this simplex and the lattice points inside of that simplex, as long as things are co-prime enough, whatever, that actually is a simplex. Uh, and there's some kind of, there's some sort of beauty, uh, beautiful um, uh, numerology happening. But, uh, but the point is that the curve points inside of the simplex are actually simultaneous chords and other type. And now you could ask how many are there? Uh, as further evidence that this is a good thing, you get beautiful numbers. So let's move a little bit quickly here. Um, Rudy Suter uh, in 98 gave us a way to, to count these. Um, and what happens is you're able to translate between the simplex that I gave you and a different simplex, uh, just a B-fold dilation of the fundamental alcove. So it's just a B-fold dilation of, um, of, of, some, of some standard simplex that lives, that's associated to the affine vial group. And you can easily write down a generating function. This is now just lattice points living inside of some simplex, like dilations of the simplex. That's what, that's what this left-hand side is recording. So you can just expand this out. And, uh, and these CIs are recording uh, the coefficients of the highest root when expressed in the simple root basis. And uh, so you just check this case by case that you really get this very nice formula uh, in terms of uh, these exponents, whatever those are. Um, so this is due to Rudy Suter. And this is generalizing. If you did this in type A, then you'd get this one over A plus B times uh, A plus B choose B. Well, maybe a different form, but it doesn't matter. The same number. Um, in fact, this, this theorem uh, was proven well before Rudy Suter. It was proven by, uh, by Mark Heyman in, in 94. Uh, he proved the same theorem. Uh, he did it completely differently though. Uh, and let me, just, let me just show you the steps of the proof. I won't actually tell you what they are. Um, so first of all, he's using Earhart theory. Earhart theory just says, okay, if I have um, a lattice and I've got some polytope that's rational in the lattice, so let's say some dilation, some integer dilation of it has vertices in L, then I can count the number of lattice points inside of that, uh, inside of that polytope as some quasi polynomial. It's basically a polynomial, but the, the coefficients are allowed to be periodic functions. Okay, and you can explicitly say that it's of to some particular degree, it's degree N, it's got some period. Okay, so we're, we're good. Uh, so this is Earhart theory. Um, and uh, so Mark Heyman's proof uh, uses Earhart theory, but it doesn't just use Earhart theory, it uses a bunch of things. So first of all, he gets polynomiality by Earhart theory. Uh, let's ignore the technical difficulties. So Earhart theory gives you polynomiality. He's just trying to figure out the number of co root points living inside of this particular simplex. Then he says, well, okay, um, I only get, since it's, uh, since uh, I have some sort of co primality con uh, condition going on or some sort of relatively primeness condition, uh, I'm going to use Dirichlet's theorem on primes and arithmetic progressions. Uh, and, uh, and then furthermore, he's going to use Burnside's lemma. Uh, and, uh, and a relationship between the number of these lattice points and, and some particular torus. 
And uh, then he's going to use the Shepard Todd formula, which is a sum over the number of fixed points, um, or the, the, the dimension of the, uh, of, of the fixed space, I guess, uh, for, uh, it's, a, it's a generic function for the dimension of the fixed space uh, for finite reflection groups. Um, so he uses all of these components, puts them together, and beautifully concludes uh, the following uh, expression. Uh, really, really amazing proof. This is, appears in section seven of his Conjectures on the Diagonal Ring by, um, uh, uh, by the co-invariant ring by diagonal uh, uh, invariance, it's section seven and it's like two paragraphs and it's, it's just glorious. Um, okay, so anyway, so you get these nice formulas. Uh, so this is evidence that this is the right object to be considering as the generalization of simultaneous cores uh, is what I'm trying to say. Oh, and here we are. Okay, so uh, we have generalized A cores using the co-root lattice. We've generalized the size, the number of boxes in a core as this quadratic form. And then we've generalized um, actually simultaneous cores, simultaneously A and B cores using um, these lattice points. So that brings us now to the final section, Wait, which is I'm our- sorry. So, could you say, so for in type A, you have A and B, right? Parameters. And in here do have, is B an integer and A is some- Oh uh, yeah, A is gonna be, um, a, a is gonna be the Coxeter number and B is going to be something that's relatively prime to the Coxeter number. Okay. Yep. All right, so that brings us to Armstrong's conjecture. Uh, so in 2011, I think around probably before that, Drew was playing with uh, simultaneous cores, very interested in um, you know, zeta maps and uh, QT combinatorics. And, uh, and he came up with the, the following really interesting conjecture. So if I'm looking at the expected size of a simultaneous AB core, A and B are, are relatively prime, uh, then it's given by this, this glorious formula. Um, and, uh, and actually, if you are asking about the, the expected size of a self-conjugate AB core, then it's the same formula, strange. And uh, Paul Johnson, um, shortly after, gave a really, really, really beautiful proof of, that, uh, of, of, uh, of Drew's conjecture um, using a generalization of Earhart theory, um, uh, which I've tentatively called the polynomial method. Um, so uh, the idea here is now, instead of just summing over the number of lattice points, instead of counting the number, what you can do is you can weight them by some polynomial. And if you do that, then you can again get it, you again are guaranteed quasi-polynomiality. You can control the degree and the period, okay? That's all you need. That's all we need from this, is just this, this generalization. Once you do that, now you've got your quadratic form, you're summing over things, you win, you win, you win. So, um, so, what does Paul Johnson's method let us do? Well, for example, if you're Zeilberger and, uh, and Zeilberger's computer, then you get to write down beautiful expressions for the sixth moment of size, for example, on simultaneous cores and guess the, that, they're, that they're supposed to be given by this simple formula and then uh, actually have them be given by that formula because you've just computed enough values and you knew that it was supposed to be a quasi polynomial, so you win. Um, so that's cool. And uh, okay, so we have a generalization now. So Marco and I originally just had this formula for simply laced type, and now we've generalized it. So, so the point is that now we're looking at the expected value of size, this quadratic form, in these, this generalization of core, of simultaneous core, which are co root points living inside of this weird dilation of the fundamental alcove. And the point is, and, and we can do it for any, um, not just simply laced, but any, any, um, any Cartan type now. So we have B co-prime to H and we can consider this. And what happens is uh, you get this funny factor, R G check. Remember that G check is the dual Coxeter number of the dual root system. Um, and you get R, the ratio of this uh, length to long to short, H is the Coxeter number. And of course this factor was invisible when you're in simply laced type where, where the dual Coxer number, the dual root system is just the Coxer number and R is equal to one. So this is us getting our blue check mark. This is what we wanted to do. Um, okay, uh, and so uh, what am I going to say? Uh, oh, let me just show you why this gives you uh, Armstrong's, uh, Armstrong's thing. So uh, in type A where things are simply laced, I guess this thing goes away because G check is just H and, um, and R is just one. And so now N is A minus one and B is still B and H is A. Uh, and then 24 is 24. Uh, we'll say more about 24 in a quick sec as we finish. And uh, so we get uh, Drew's formula there. And for A even, uh, I need A even here, then I can write things down. So R here is two uh, and type C and G check, you'll believe me is A minus one. Okay. Uh, and H is A. And then n is uh, n is a over two, uh, and b minus one, 
And then H is A plus B plus one, okay, divided by 24. So I'm just writing this down in the specialization. And what you're gonna notice is that this two and this A cancel with this two array and I get the same formula. Okay, so, so, so Drew's other conjecture is, 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 is recovered by type C at least when, um, uh, when A was even. Okay, so those are special cases, uh, but generalizes that. Uh, proof strategy. Oh yeah, you don't wanna hear about this. Uh, so let's just not do that. Uh, basically it's polynomial method. Uh, you check enough zeros and you win. Uh, so case by case. I think that's what I wanna say about that. Um, and so let me, let me summarize and then say one more thing. So um, we had uh, A cores and we generalized them to co-root lattices. Then what we did was use McDonald's formula to interpret a sum over, um, over well, co-roots uh, as it was some weights to give us a, uh, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this form, this quadratic form for that, 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 in, that, that gave us a, a formula for size in other types. Um, then, we, then we used the Summers region um, uh, to, to figure out what simultaneous cores were supposed to be by interpreting it as a simplex. And then, uh, then we wrote down the formula for uh, the, the, the corresponding formula for Armstrong's conjecture in, in general type uh, for this expected size with this very strange uh, uh, thing here, which just becomes one in simply list type, recovering my earlier paper with Marco. And just one quick thing, because uh, I know we have to get to Alejandro's talk. Um, I wanted to just explain the strange because that's always nice to do. So the point is that this 24 is looking pretty weird. The reason that 24 is there is actually coming, it's due to an evaluation basically at zero. So when I'm trying to find these zeros to do the polynomial method, I find one maybe at zero or something like this. And uh, to evaluate that, I have to use this strange for formula of Freudenthal and de Vries, which they were using in the context of, of Lie theory. And it's, for, <laughs> it's originally for just uh, uh, the inner product of rho with rho, which is half some of the of the of the positive roots, um, we are using row check. Like we're clearly doing something wrong when you've got g check. You're doing something wrong. Dual Cox number, the dual root system is no good. Um, but um, but yeah, so this is equivalent to their strange formula. It's called the strange formula. And people since then have done all. You know, there's like a very strange formula, and I don't know. I'm sure there's an even stranger formula. Whatever. Uh, okay, so um, I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, so thanks very much, and uh, that's all. Thank you.